speaker is Dr. Paul Harsh. Uh, Dr. Harsh received his um, medical degree from uh, Johns Hopkins University. Uh, he did his uh, postgraduate training uh, at the University of Colorado Health Sciences Center. Um, right now, he is um, uh, board certified in both um, emergency medicine and in hyperbaric medicine. So, double board certified. Um, I guess your official title is Chair, President, CEO, Grand Poopa, Harsh, uh, Harsh Hyperbaric uh, Oxygen. So we welcome Dr. Harsh. Thank you. Thank you. And first of all, thanks to Biala for the opportunity to come and speak this year. Uh, this is the first year, and uh, I hope this is going to be memorable. We're going to turn the lights down here in just a second because you can see these slides a little bit better, and thankfully it's in the morning, so everybody will be awake. Well, this is going to be an overview of hyperbaric oxygen therapy and traumatic brain injury. We're going to focus a little bit on the veterans. Of course, this is uh, our conference here. And uh, I have t a few jobs. One of them is the private center where we've done all of this work now for 20 uh, four years. Um, and the other is, uh, I'm downtown at LSU, I direct the hyperbaric department there, and I'm a clinical professor of medicine. And what I want to do is start out with two cases. One is a subacute severe traumatic brain injury case, 19 year old male, four months after severe TBI, spent a month in the ICU, three months at a well known rehabilitation center in southeast Louisiana where he made no progress. And at 90 day insurance limit, uh, the family was told to take him home. Uh, you have what you have. There's nothing that can be done for him. Uh, we were unable to advance him any further. And the mother is like, what am I gonna do with him? Uh, and so she went to church on that Sunday. She was told this on Friday. And uh, she happened to go, she just picked a church in the New Orleans area, went in there and asked the priest to have the congregation pray for her son. In the audience was a physician and his wife, both of whom I treated for a traumatic brain injury with hyperbaric oxygen. And uh, they heard the story and afterwards, they walked up to him and this physician uh, said to him, young man, you're gonna get up out of that wheelchair. And of course, you'll see the state he's in. He had no concept. And uh, said to the mother, look, uh, excuse me, before you leave New Orleans, just, just go across uh, uh, the river there and, and give an opinion. And she did, and this is what happened. This is a short five minute video, and then we'll get back to it. And you're gonna see him the day he comes into my clinic. High speed motor vehicle accident, didn't understand. He told me seven years later he had tried to commit suicide. And that's how this happened. And as he went through the windshield, he had a spiritual experience and met God, he said. And I'll finish the story later. But imagine if this were your son. So this is three days after discharge from the rehab hospital. And I'm just, uh, I video every patient and try to do before and after just to capture because you can see so much on the video that you can't explain with physical exams and so on. You see the Earth, scalp surgeries. You can see he's pretty unresponsive. Well, after about 36 hyperbaric treatments, he was animated, talking, uh, not talking, joking. And I brought him in the room. I said, it's time to reevaluate you, Kurt. You are going to help so many people when they see the change in you. And he comes in, and this is what he does. And his mother and I are like, what is going on? 
two minutes before, he's animated, he's laughing, he's listening to jokes. Halfway through it, I'm down doing reflexes, and I look up, and he's laughing at me. And I said, you're joking, aren't you? And I couldn't get him to do this, so we turned the camera off now. Just look one time and smile. He's not going to do it. He's a teenager. We turned the camera off, and he jacking the boxes up, and there he is. So this is him playing a joke on me after... You're kidding. Can you tell me your name? What's your first name? I don't yes, know. Yes, you do know. Come on. What's your first name? Isn't it Kurt? And what's your last name? Tell you what, can you look at the light for a second? Talking. And I want you to just follow the light. He's conversing. Tells me he wants to drive. He actually does now. He has his own place. He works at Walmart, up in Shreveport. To you, you just went over him a few minutes ago. I'm and sorry, the sound is... What are you now doing that you weren't doing before? Are you walking, right? He's now walking. Or take a picture of that. What else? All right, shoot. How about, how about this thing here? His peg, too. Are you using that? You're no, eating he's eating. No. You're eating, aren't you? You're eating on your own, right? Have you gained some weight? You can go search this on YouTube. It's a 10 minute video. We cut it down to five here. AMA News reviewed this as they said the, the last two weeks. Walking, walking more. The video quality is poor, the sound is not good, it's unprofessional, but the impact is unmistakable. Look at him. Okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to get up under your own power and go and help. Like I said, he now works at Walmart. He has his own home. <coughs> he drives. He bought his own home, excuse me. Imagine if this were your son. So as he went through the windshield, um, I hope I, I know how to get out of this. Let's escape. Escape. Thanks. I am so computer stupid, it's beyond belief. <laughs> as he went through the windshield, he said God showed him two choices. And he said he saw all of this beauty that was obviously heaven, and he saw these people wailing and crying, and, and it's just a terrible scene. And he said, you have a choice. You can go back, and you will have this, but you will have a very difficult life. Or he said, you can die, essentially. Now, this is seven years afterwards I'm hearing this. I didn't know he had tried to commit suicide and what had happened, but the story was, it just was, uh, unbelievable. Well, now I want to show you another case here. This is somebody who is <coughs> six years out from severe traumatic brain injury. And it's the difference in what you could do when you get to someone early and stop the disease process or injury process. And this is another patient who the physiatrist who referred the patient did not tell me this was a, a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the brain. It was another suicide attempt. And he thought, well, if I knew that, maybe we wouldn't treat her this type of thing. 
But uh, so here she is. Uh, happened in 1989, coma, prolonged recovery, evaluated six years later by me. Palm referral, she's paraplegic, actually she's almost quadriplegic. Severe weakness, arms, hands, severe spasticity. Spasms at night that keep her awake most of the time because of pain, uh, headaches, and of course the insomnia. She's chronically sleep deprived, poor trunk control, severe constipation from the autonomic injury. And uh, what we did was evaluate her with brain imaging and treated her, and over the course of the next four months, independent evaluation verified improvement in spasticity, got some hand function back, normal bowel movements, able to sleep at night because the spasms were gone. And I want to show you the brain scans. These are brain blood flow scans, and we're looking from the side, so face is up here, face would be here. This is behind the forehead, so frontal lobes. And you can see where the bullet track came in, the right temple went up over the top of the skull and just cored out this area. On CT, there isn't a lot of damage there. But on a blood flow scan, you can see how much of the brain isn't working. Well, here she is after one treatment. Yeah, shit. <laughs> exactly. That's, uh, and there she was after 80 hyperbaric treatments with improved neurological function. So what's going on here? Well, I wanted to start with just a review of brain microanatomy and macroanatomy, the injury process, then get to hyperbaric oxygen. The brain, as everybody knows, is con composed of two types of cells. Neurons, which were always thought to be the ones doing all the thinking, and glial cells, which were thought to be support and nourishing cells, but in fact now are implicated in the thinking process. And I like to think of them uh, as a, just a model and metaphor as little trees. Every neuron has branches. They all sum down to a trunk where the cell body is, and it puts out an axon, which branches many times. And of course, the neurons have all sorts of different shapes and configurations depending on where they are in the brain, the function they serve, but they're all essentially little trees. And you can see, here's the tree trunk. It's one axon or root that comes out, and it touches another tree's branches, the dendrites. And all those electrical messages are summed up. Of course, at the touch there is the synapse, where the chemicals come across, and they change and make an electrical change on the opposite cell. Well, and you can see, I mean, these are photomicrographs, how beautifully complex the brain are. You can see the neurons and all of their processes and connectivity. It is just incredibly complicated. Uh, the same here with the neurons and their, their branches and such. Well, we also have the glial cells. They nourish, support, and modulate. They influence blood flow. They have electrical activity. They communicate with neurons. They have stem cell capability. They're nine times as plentiful as neurons, and everybody always thought that they were worthless. Now, why would we have, you know, 100 billion brain cells and, <coughs> what is it, a trillion glial cells if they didn't do something, right? And again, they're now thought to be involved with our imagination and our thinking mind. Well, here's a little schematic of microglia, the blue ones, and we've got the Schwann cells, which actually coat the axons of the neurons and the astrocytes, which are these. And if we look over here in this photomicrograph with the luminescence, the astrocytes, uh, the glial cells are in green, and the neurons and their processes are in purple. So this is all interdigitated uh, in a very, very complicated way. Well, if we think of all of these neurons as little trees, there are different types of neurons, just like different types of trees, and they have different functions, motor, sensory, excitatory, inhibitory, uh, et cetera. And they also produce, each of them, a different neurotransmitter, almost like a different fruit on the tree that touches the, the other trees. And these trees are then organized in forests or regions in the brain that give us certain function. Uh, and um, they're mi mainly arranged in the areas that are the gray matter, which is the cortex, the deep gray matter, basal ganglia, and then down in the brain stem. Well, so if you look at a functional map, this is kind of what it looks like where you know, memory, sound, I mean, this is so gross. As it turns out, and if you do a cutaway, the sagittal view, again, we're looking from the side, but if you cut right away at the middle, you can see all the internal structures as well. But they're low, uh, they're, they're, each of the anatomic areas has gross function. As it turns out, though, just a few months ago, a uh, Berkeley Imaging Lab, University of California, made an unbelievable discovery. They found that, uh, they showed movies to people during which there were 1,700 different <laughs> visual images. And they tracked the brain with functional MRI. And what they found was 
fully 20% of the entire brain was involved in vision with storage of all of the parts, retrieval, and so on. And what it meant was and showed was that our function is so distributed all over the brain. And that's part of how we adapt after an injury. We use some of these areas. Well, the brain organizes it into different uh, types of cells, if you, weigh, uh, if you will. They call it a continuous semantic space. So for instance, here's a wheeled vehicle, but all of the pink ones are where vehicle images are stored. Up here are rodents and mammals and uh, you know, birds, reptiles in all of the yellows, uh, persons in green, et cetera. So we've got all of this space the brain organizes and stores our visual images in. It's not just back in the visual cortex. Okay, well if we look at macro anatomy, the other part of the brain, how do all those cells communicate with each other is by that axon that goes out. That's the root, if you will. And it touches all the rest of the, the brain cells, uh, hundreds to thousands of them. And what happens is they travel in broad pathways where the brain cells are clumped over short distances, of course, there's all the communication. But the white matter tracts in the brain are all of these connecting, I like to think of it as cable. It's like our you know, cable TV. Well, now with diffusion tensor imaging, this is a coronal view, the, the loaf bread, a loaf of bread type of slicing where you go from front to back in this direction. And we're looking straight at the person's face, but it's right about the midbrain. Every one of these different colors is a different white matter track and its orientation. And here's another. This is now the transfer slice, the stack of pancakes, where you're looking at from the foot. So face would be up there, back of head. But again, you can see these broad, different white matter tracks that are connecting different areas of the brain. Well, so let's go to traumatic brain injury and definition. Non-degenerative, non-congenital insult to the brain from an external mechanical force possibly leading to permanent or temporary impairment of cognitive, physical, and psychosocial functions with an associated diminished or altered state of consciousness. This is crazy. It's a hit on the head that causes damage and then dysfunction, okay? Well, little statistics, 1.7 million a year in the U.S. estimated, it's probably a gross underestimate because of all the ones that aren't reported, about 275,000 hospitalizations, 1.4 million ED visits, 52,000 deaths. And you're gonna see 60% of those are preventable. And I'll show you the statistics. 75% of them overall are mild TBIs. And this is the fact sheet from the CDC. Well, how about Louisiana? Here's Louisiana. First we'll do the US. 35% are due to falls, TBIs, motor vehicle accidents, 17%, assault 10. Here in Louisiana, 41% are motor vehicle. We can't drive, everybody knows that. <laughs> Firearms, 31%. We settle things the good old fashioned way. And falls are about 28%. So we have a little bit of a different type of, of distribution here in Louisiana. But let's look at what happens with a traumatic brain injury. I'm just gonna take the simple flexion extension type of injury where the head's in motion and it comes to an abrupt stop. Well, what happens is the brain ratchets back and forth in the skull, and if it's a rotatory one, you can imagine all the different forces. And this is why every brain injury is so idiosyncratic. It's your brain and your anatomy and the type of forces that are involved gives a very individual injury. Well, there's a primary injury where the brain makes direct contact with the inside of the skull. And what happens is you get, of course, a scalp injury, skull fractures, contusion to the brain surface. And then there's the internal acceleration, deceleration. So the head is moving and suddenly it stops. And internally you get shear, stretch, compression, and tearing. If you look at these images here of the brain, this is the top view. This is looking from the front, the side. The purple areas are the areas on the top of the brain where the brain is tethered to the skull. And what happens when you shift the brain? You tear the vessels. Subdural, epidural hematomas. The blue are the direct contusion areas. What are the primary areas injured in traumatic brain injury? Inferior frontal lobes and anterior temporal lobes. Why? They sit in the bony base of the skull and they are directly impacted against it, as is the back of the brain where the, the visual cortex is and cerebellum. But if you look on the inside, all those white matter tracks where all the shearing takes place is the pink, and this is where so much of the damage is done. So you get damage, that's diffuse axonal injury when it's 
severe, but even with the milder cases, that's where a lot of the injury is taking place. So if we take a look at each of these axons, here's the cell body and its root coming out, and it's covered with myelin, which is kind of like organized mayonnaise. It has this little, the axon has a transport system down and a little fine superstructure to it, like a little erector set that thing, nutrients are traveling down, but it's very, very fragile. What happens is the axon is injured because of the stretching, flexing, et cetera, and eventually what it does, it snaps. Well, if we look at photomicrographs of it, you can see here are the swollen axons in brown. And what happens is once they divide, all of that stuff transported down the axon builds up into what are called these retraction balls. So what happens is you get these little pathological areas where you've essentially divided the white matter. Well, if you divide the cable, there's no transmission down the cable, and it doesn't work. The cell, however, may not be dead. Now, this can die back all the way to the cell. It's called Wallerian degeneration, and you can kill the cell, but it doesn't have to happen. Well, with functional MRI now, we can see these. And I want you to memorize this picture because you're going to see it again later a little differently. But this is, again, the stack of pancakes view, the transverse image. And look where all the damage is. Blue actually areas of dysregulated increase flow and the red decrease. But it's areas of damage. They're in the white matter. You see all the white matter tracks? There's the gray matter, all the brain cells around the outside. Caught eight nucleus there, deep gray matter. The whole point is most of the damage is in the white matter. Well, now with diffusion, uh, diffusion tensor imaging, you can get a better view of this. This is the sagittal view. So we're looking from the side, and we're right in the middle of the brain where all the white matter tracks project. And here they are. Normally, this is solid orange all the way out to here. But you can see what's happened. All the white matter has been truncated here, here. You can see it's like a brush that, that has been thinned out. And these are the damaged white matter tracks. You can see there's still tracks remaining there, and of course the cells they came from are still alive. So you can still rehabilitate something. Well, my model, and the way I've thought about this the most, and I think it, it, it gives me an ability to understand brain injury, is if we think of the white matter in the brain like cable, like cable TV. And that's essentially what it is. They are very, very fragile. These are, um, uh, well, they're cable, and you can see the light that's traveling down the end of them, similar to the electricity. Uh, this is like a fiber optic cable. And of course, if we look at what cable does worldwide and the ability to transmit, it is exactly like we have in the brain, transmitting those electrical messages over great distances all the way down to the spinal cord. OK, so if we look at our cable distribution center, what happens? It goes out to various homes and branches. So we've got all of these homes that are lit up downstream, which means touching other neurons, essentially. Well, what happens if you knock out the cable here? To get function down there in the TVs and transmit electrical, you've got to somehow get a branch of that cable over here, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's exactly what the brain does. So if we look at the brain, here's our neuron, and we damage one of the white matter tracks. We've got two brain cells here that are sending their process and touching the tree on the branches. You can see the synapses. And if you cut one, what happens to this input down here? Well, you have a couple choices. What you can do, and this is now for the spinal cord, nice long length. Here we are up in the brain, in the brain stem. And here are the neurons going down to the spinal cord level, wherever you choose. And now we damage the cord. This could be up in the brain as well. But what happens is you can now form a new little tract over to one of these spinal neurons, hopefully uh, now transmit down here. You can start growing some more from this one here, or even down here you can try to impact. What you end up having is all of this spaghetti. Well, think of what happens in traumatic brain injury. As you injure white matter, you don't have the same amount of cable to send the messages over. And you're now trying to send it over all these alternate pathways, and what happens? Processing speed goes down, right? People can't handle crowded room, noise, the mall, little children. It's mainly because you're overloading the existing tracks that, that remain. And so if you look at this with the axons, what happens, damage here, you essentially have to grow it over here. So now we've got one track doing what two did before. What happens? You've lost reserve capacity. And now, God help you if something happens to that track, right? Well, you can compromise it in busy situations, tax it, sleep deprivation, whatever. 
you no longer have the redundancy to carry out the function. And so I'm going back to our cable model. Here's the cable, and now you knock a whole bunch of it out. What happens? You've got this little bit of cable still supplying all those homes or neurons. And what you lose is essentially bandwidth. It's like going from cable back to cable modem, right? And think of how that impacts people functionally. It's processing speed. It's not being able to handle what you could. It's not being able to tolerate alcohol. Alcohol is a great test of reserve capacity. How many beers can you drink now? And you'll have everybody with a traumatic brain injury, oh God, I can't do that anymore. You know, two beers and I'm on my rear end. And the reason is you don't have that reserve capacity anymore. And you can do this with all your organ systems. We have two lungs, take one out. You're okay, but you're not gonna be a competitive athlete. You're not gonna do good in Denver, Colorado. Got two kidneys, same thing. You can lose a big chunk of your heart in a heart attack. You'll still live, you'll be okay, but you are not gonna be a competitive runner. And same thing, you're not gonna be okay at altitude. And I'm gonna show you something with altitude in just a second. So what ends up happening is we essentially are the reduction in bandwidth. <laughs> uh oh. You know. Okay, who's computer savvy? Say, we're the IT person. What's going on? He can't get it to shift to the next slide. Oh, go. See, in the old days, <laughs> you had that carousel, and all you needed was the extra bulb when it burned out. Okay. How'd you do? How'd you do that? Just click. Just click on that. You click on there. You guys just click that. All right. Press that button. There's the hero. Yeah, let me tell you. Everybody needs to have an IT person. Oh yeah. So what's happened is you damage these tracks and you drop your cable. And so, all right. Let's go to the other area of the brain that's primarily injured. And you know about this, everybody knows. What's affected most after a traumatic brain injury? Memory, short-term memory. The hippocampus is another area that's primarily injured. It's a C-shaped structure, which if we look from the side, it's in the temporal lobe, directly in from the ear, and makes a circle up to the frontal lobe. And there it is, right there. Actually, this whole formation is part of the hippocampal formation. And of course, because of where it sits, it is primarily involved in the injury process. Okay, you're gonna get tested again here. All right, and uh, so that's the primary injury. Well, what happens the second the injury is impacted? The second you've got tissue damage, you now have the inflammatory reaction takes over and you get swelling, reduced blood flow, excitatory <coughs> neurotransmitters, and a host of damage. And in fact, this is worse than the primary injury itself. Uh, and as it turns out, it's stereotypic. So it doesn't matter whether you're hit in the arm or somebody runs some electricity through your leg or even a toxin or someone interrupts blood flow with a tourniquet or you have a trauma. There's a little bit of difference in the type of injury and the impact it has immediately. But the second the injury happens, what happens after that is the inflammatory reaction and it's stereotypic. It happens the same way every time. It's like taking a DVD, sticking it in, and it plays from start to finish every single time, whether it's in the brain or anywhere in the body. And what that ends up doing is there is an evolution of disease process as it proceeds. And I'm just gonna show you some quick slides. Here is time going out three months. And these are the different cell types, the different phases of the inflammatory reaction. And the point of it all is to just show you, here is also the different type, lymphocytes, macrophages, neutrophils. You can see that they cycle in and out at different points. And in the long term, you still have inflammatory cells involved. Same here, another picture of these cells and how it goes on with collagen deposition, which is scarring over time. And finally, here's the process translated to genetics. What we do is we are activating all sorts of different genes, even years out, that are playing in the whole remodeling of the injury process. Well, the net result of all of this is that we get microscopic wounds in both the gray and white matter. Now with severe traumatic brain injury, of course, there's more. It's proportional to the amount of force and damage. 
But these little wounds consist of living cells, dead cells, and living non-functional brain tissue that are in evolution. And this is going on for quite some period of time. And you know, everybody has told you, well, time will help. The longer you get, there's remodeling, there's improvement. The NIH used to think that uh, uh, endpoints for traumatic brain injury studies and outcome were six months to a year. They've completely redone that now. They're saying people remodel and improve four, five, ten years out. Now, granted, it slows, but it's still going on. And of course, that's all good for neuro rehab. Well, if we take any one of these little wounds in the brain, like I showed you on the brain scan there, the, the red and the, the blue, or orange and blue, and you cut right across it, what you've got is normal circulation, then at the center it's damaged. And what happens is there's a blood flow and an oxygen gradient across that. And when we put someone in a hyperbaric chamber, you dramatically increase the amounts of oxygen here. And it has a certain effect that I'm going to show you in a minute. So each of these areas here, these are the ones that show up that are big enough. These are not microscopic. The microscopic ones you cannot even see. And, but collectively, that's what's giving so much of the injury in traumatic brain injury. Okay, so let's shift gears, and I want to specifically focus a little more on just mild to moderate traumatic brain injury, but everything here is pretty much true about severe traumatic brain injury, except possibly with respect to PTSD, which we'll talk about a little bit at the end. But there are the figures again, in terms of total numbers of TBI in the country, about 1.3 million of them are mild. Between 5 and 80% of patients with concussion, mild TBI, report TBI-related sequelae for months or years post-injury, and there are multiple references on this. Well, as it turns out, the traditional opinion is everybody gets better, and if you don't, it's a psychiatric problem. And as it turns out, if you look at this, there's now substantial empirical literature base showing that post-concussion syndrome symptoms are typically influenced by factors other than head injury, such as premorbid slash comorbid factors and litigation, which are not specifically caused by head injury. Oh. And these are very prominent people in the TBI field. And this has actually been the position of the military and Department of Defense. All of these veterans, oh, they had a premorbid personality disorder. Oh, they're nuts. Oh, they're depressed. They have PTSD, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I'm going to show you some things here. But in addition, sometimes in medicine, when we don't have a treatment or we don't adequately understand a condition, we conveniently give it a psychiatric diagnosis. And that is the best example. Autism. All the research points to an organic problem in the brain, yet where is this listed? It's a psychiatric diagnosis. And of course, look at the post-concussional disorder. Where is it described? Diagnostic and Statistical Manual 4. That's the psychiatric Bible. Another psychiatric syndrome. Well, if you look at, these are just the research criteria from the Military TBI <coughs> Task Force of what you have to have, the symptoms occurring and so on, and when they occur. And I'm not going to go through it all, but you have to have it following a head injury, a substantial or a substantial worsening of a pre-existing symptom. Uh, causing significant impairment and decline from a premorbid level, and it doesn't fit the diagnostic criteria for dementia <coughs> or another diagnosis. Well, again, that's the military statement and position on this. Well, as it turns out, you know, we have, if the post-concussion syndrome isn't resolved within about three months or so, you start sliding over into the persistent post-concussional disorder, which are symptoms that are lasting three to six months or more, and they estimate this is about 10% of mild to moderate traumatic brain injury cases. Uh, and again, multiple references for you. I'm not making this up. In the military, the figures are all over the place for our veterans who have come back. Zero to 89%. The three largest studies showing five to seven, but these are just survey studies. They aren't where they actually sat down with the patients and made a diagnosis. So the, the figure is likely higher and more consistent with what we have in the civilian community. Well. As it turns out, in the military, once you have this diagnosis of TBI, which means post-concussion syndrome, PTSD, or the combination, this was just published last year. They did, the General Accounting Office did a survey of the VA, and what they found was that they looked at the people with those diagnoses four years after entry into the VA system. 70% of those with the diagnosis of TBI, 80% with PTSD, and 100% with the combined diagnoses <coughs> we're still receiving care. 
meaning the current treatment is not working. Well, as it turns out, there is no standard effective treatment for the combination of diagnoses that leads to post-concussion syndrome and PTSD. And as it turns out, though, going to this whole psychiatric idea, the information has been around since, look at these dates, 75, 62, where if you have a traumatic brain injury, we're just going to use the threshold of loss of consciousness. If you lose consciousness, you lose brain cells. And these are from autopsy studies that have shown that results in neuronal loss and atrophy, which is shrinkage of the brain, three and six months later with greater atrophy if there was loss of consciousness. So this is just from concussion. They've looked at autopsy studies and shown that over time you lose brain tissue, which means it's an organic problem. And it matters, you know, can you recover or not? There are a lot of things that go into whether you can recover and get on with life. However, everybody has always thought in the medical profession, everybody should get better, no harm, no foul, you go your way and there's no signature of it. Until this doctor did this ignored study, Dr. Ewing took two groups of patients, mild traumatic brain injury, two to three years before had been knocked out, single episode, got over it, got better, and three years later, totally asymptomatic. No symptoms, back doing their life, whatever. Age and education matched them to a group of normals who had never been knocked out, had no neurological disease, and similarly were asymptomatic. And what they did, she gave them a set of cognitive tests and then put them in an altitude chamber and took them to 11,000 feet altitude, like in the Rockies, and repeated the test. And what did they find? People who'd had a previous TBI had a 10 to 15% significant reduction in cognitive function. So what's it tell you? Once again, you lose tissue, there is lost reserve capacity, and even though you can go about your life, and most people do, you can bring that out with certain stressful situations. This was hypoxia, but you can do it with sleep deprivation, you can do it with other types of stress as well. And of course, where does that eventually play out? You know all the figures now, they're coming out at the end of life where we gradually, with aging, dwindle down our reserve capacity, and what happens? People are coming to dementia earlier in life. Well, I'm going to show you there's only one thing that can restore reserve capacity. So essentially, there's evidence for residual wounding in the brain after mild TBI. And we're now seeing the imaging studies coming out. Look at this, 2012. Last year, two of these, I quoted them in an article that I had written. But essentially, from mild traumatic brain injuries, there it is with advanced imaging. We're now seeing the wounds that were only seen on autopsy before, and they're unmistakable. So the net conclusion is that in concussion and even in blast exposure without concussion, the residual effect is persistent white matter wounding. Okay, what's hyperbaric oxygen? I'm finally getting to the guts of this. Well, this is the physiologic definition that was redefined in 1999. It's the use of greater than atmospheric pressure oxygen as a drug. I don't like to use that so much, but that's kind of how we're dosing it and we're using it to treat basic disease processes or states and hence the diseases. So this is a drug that treats underlying disease processes. It turns out the processes are common to many disease states. And so here's just a picture of a single chamber. People lay in it, clear acrylic, watch TV or whatever, and you turn the pressure up and give people pure oxygen for a period of time. Seems pretty simple. Well, what are we doing? Essentially, we are treating the disease processes anywhere along that spectrum where the DVD is playing. So you saw that first patient there, four months out. Dramatic results when you can get to someone earlier on. Other people, many years out. That other patient was six years out. In my book, the longest one is 48 years out. He's the man who wrote the introduction to the book. He's a lobbyist in, in Washington. So what we're doing is where we intervene, we're impacting the disease processes at the point in the disease or injury. Well, as it turns out, if we consider hyperbaric oxygen drug for disease processes, not diseases, how is hyperbaric oxygen actually affecting the disease processes? Well. It's been known for years, if you daily put someone in a hyperbaric oxygen chamber with a non-healing wound, what happens? You grow new tissue. You grow new blood vessels, new fibroblasts, 
the collagen is deposited, especially in extremity wounds, and you heal the wound. Well, how can you do that? You have got to go through the DNA of the cells. And all these years, 40 years ago, nobody really put it together. It was like, okay, do the hyperbaric and tissue growth, it heals. Well, thanks to biochemical techniques now, the sophistication of it, what has been found out is that this is the only non-hormonal DNA signaling drug that we have. Hormones actually do their action by acting on the DNA and causing various changes in the cell. But it turns out that rise and fall of oxygen is doing the same thing. And if we look at a gene here and this promoter segment and proteins on it, what finally turns that gene on and makes it transcribed is a combination of a bunch of proteins and it turns out hyperbaric oxygen can signal it. Well, there were scattered articles over about, oh, 10 years that had shown one type of hormone or another and the DNA and RNA and the intermediary gene products that were caused by hyperbaric oxygen. But finally, these people, Dr. Godman did this study in 2009. Dave's not on it here. What they did was take some human biopsy. They just took tissue, human tissue, and they ground it all up and they got the cells that lined the inside of the smallest blood vessels in our body. And they put them in a Petri dish and they gave them one hyperbaric treatment and did a continuous mass gene array analysis all of our chromosomes for 24 hours. At the end of 24 hours, 8,101 genes were turned on or turned off. What was turned on? The genes that code for growth and repair hormones and the anti-inflammatory genes. What was turned off? The pro-inflammatory genes and the genes that code for programmed cell death. And now what's been shown by the Japanese, that the segment of the chromosome that has to do with aging under hyperbaric oxygen conditions does not shorten and does not age. Michael Jackson wasn't wrong. <laughs> Everybody's seen Michael Jackson in the chamber, you know, slowly sleeping and so on. Well, in fact, they gave a lecture in 2004 at the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine. And you know, that, that, that is kind of a, there's a lot of fluff and puff stuff, you know, and creams and lotions and potions and things to prolong your life and all. But they also, their belief in, you know, low uh, growth hormone levels or uh, supplements and so on. And my argument was all the information we have is now pointing to hyperbaric oxygen as a DNA stimulative drug. And here I am treating all of these patients in dementia at the end of their life. We're showing cognitive improvement, prolongation of life. Wouldn't it make sense it affects the DNA? Well, it took another nine years, roughly, for the Japanese to do this experiment, but sure enough, we've got the information now. So, we're characterizing this. What is hyperbaric oxygen? It's a treatment for acute and chronic wounds, and specifically, wounds in any location in the body and of any duration. So, if we look at the list of these that are typically reimbursed, every one of them, that prior to, if you cut this whole side of the slide off in red, when doctors look at this, it's a hyperbaric oxygen, okay, air embolism, carbon monoxide, gas gangrene, crush injury, decompression of diabetic foot wounds, exceptional blood loss, anemia, uh, the flesh-eating bacteria, bone infection, blah, 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 blah. This makes absolutely no sense. But in fact, when you look at it as effects on underlying disease processes and wounding, they're all acute or chronic wounds or subacute wounds. And it starts to make sense and, of course, asks, why not other wounds in places in the body? And this is what happened in 1990. My mentor, Dr. Richard Neubauer, who just was pilloried for most of his career for trying to suggest that you can treat a brain injury, took a lady who was 60 years old, 14 years post major stroke, and was able to regain function in her. And the whole concept was maybe there are neurons that aren't dead or alive, but alive and not working idling neurons, just kind of sitting in place. And what he did was he did one of the brain blood flow scans on an old kind of crude scanner. And so here we're looking, the transverse stack of pancakes view, face is here, back of head. This is the right side of the head and the color map, high blood flow, so white and red. You can see the red and yellow over here. But there's almost none here. That's the huge stroke she had. Paralyzed on one side of the body, constant drooling, can't swallow, peg tube, can't speak, has really total dependence and can't walk. And what happened, this was before hyperbarics, they put her in the chamber one time to see if maybe it would change things and look what happened right in the middle of the seemingly dead area on MRI. This area lit up with blood flow. Well, what is that? 
It's the speech motor area and the area that controls the face and mouth. And over the course of 16 months, 14 years post major stroke, this lady stopped drooling, started to talk a little bit, could chew and swallow, and they could get her up, and she had assisted ambulation. It was sent to the Lancet and published as, look, we got idling neurons that can hang around for all these years and stimulate, be stimulated to function. Well, that started what we were doing, uh, or I should say it gave us some <laughs> what I started noticing, right as this was published in 1990, that our patients with diabetic foot wounds who had previous strokes in the chamber with hyperbarics started getting neurological function back. And one guy was exactly like this, 12 years post, hadn't spoken, mute, and just laid there. Wife couldn't take care of him, he wouldn't move, had to put him in a nursing home, and he got heel ulcers. Now he comes to us for wound care, the plastic surgeons got involved, okay, we'll do flaps on his heels, but we want hyperbaric oxygen. We do the hyperbaric oxygen, we get about 10, 15 treatments in, they bring him from the nursing home every day, and he's crying. He comes through the doors, he's just crying, we can't figure, what is wrong with him? I'm working him up, he can't write, he can't answer, he's mute. And I'm doing all the x-rays, poking him, prodding, and check, where's the pain? Did he break something, somebody fall, what happened? Nothing. I said, well, he can't find anything, so this is odd. We keep going about 10 more treatments, he comes in. He's waving to everybody. <laughs> He's waving us. You see this? We gave him about another, we got up to about 28, 30 treatments, he came in, hi, hello, how are you? You know, short sentences, a few words, and of course his wife came for the once a month, once a month visit after 12 years and was just freaked out. And remember the old Wendy commercials, where's the beef with Clara? She looked exactly like that lady, and we had these double doors on the hyperbaric unit, and she comes following the ambulance stretcher van in and breaks through the door. She goes, where's the doctor? And I was there that day, and I saw, I'm the doctor. She goes, what have you done to my husband? He's talking now. And the translation was, oh, I've got to bring him home, you know? Uh, probably not. But, but the whole point was, here he had recovered function. It was like, you know, the dead talking almost. And he went on to recover even further function. And that happened exactly as his article was published. Well, at the same time, we made a discovery treating our divers. Normally, it's immediate treatment in the Navy. If you don't get it back, forget it, done. And here we were treating patients two, three, five months out. And all we did was change the dose of this from the high dose the Navy was doing to something the Germans had shown brain injury was more sensitive to. And lo and behold, the patients got better. Well, we were pretty soon pressed upon to do a study, and over a number of years, we took anybody with a chronic brain injury, a minimum of one year out, and we would analyze it with the brain blood flow imaging. And in particular, what we were looking to see was if a brain blood flow scan, one treatment rescan, like Dr. Neubauer did, could predict who might improve with hyperbaric oxygen. And over the years, and I'm gonna to try to move this along, we saw a couple hundred patients in those five and a half years. And of all the diagnoses we treated, one of them that was most responsive was the traumatic brain injury. And all of these cases were years out. And that's one of them that I showed you at the beginning. Well, as I started reporting this at meetings, people said, well, oh, oh, those are just old cases, doctor. They would have gotten better on their own. It's like, well, you, you remember David Letterman's stupid pet tricks? That's like, a, that's like a stupid doctor statement. <laughs> Only a doctor would say something like that. After seven years, 12 years, oh, he would have gotten better on his own? Well, we'll believe it if you have an animal model. I said, okay, fine. So we went and took a well-known animal model, and we adapted it. And I'm going to show you. It's called the head bonk model. And what you do is you take a rat, a poor rat, and you drop a little weight onto the brain after you remove a little teeny piece of skull, and then you put the skull back, no harm, no foul, not really. <laughs> 30 days later, what happens is the brain has died on the top, just like a stroke, and they have a problem with the opposite paw. You can't tell it, they can actually want to run and all that, but if you put them up to the side of a table, they won't grab the table. It's called four limb placing. But underneath is the hippocampus, remember the memory organ. And what happens is they don't have memory, so they can't do certain tasks. Well, there's a well-known cognitive task where you put them in a pool, they swim around and see objects on the wall and try to find a buried platform. Well, what happens is from the time of that injury for nine straight months, that memory function just goes straight downhill to finally the rats at nine months, they don't get any worse. And maybe they can get a little bit better. So what we did was we took them 50 days out and 
Some got hyperbaric oxygen, some stayed in Albuquerque at the lab, 5,600 feet where the experiment was done, and the other two came to New Orleans. So here's the altitude group after uh, there's been a period of time uh, equivalent to the time that the others came to New Orleans to get their <coughs> hyperbaric treatment, and then they all got retested. Well, this is looking at blood vessel growth, more or less, and the altitude group shows a little bit of blood vessel growth in that hippocampus, which is normal, that's the healing process. The group that came to New Orleans and got kind of a fake air treatment had a little bit more, uh, and there's some reasons for that. Uh, you know, you come to sea level, now you go back to altitude, the low oxygen of altitude stimulates blood vessel growth, but it has a, a problem. But the hyperbaric oxygen had a whole lot of blood vessel growth, just like had been published. Well, how about the memory function? Remember, it's 270 days, you keep going downhill. So the altitude rats, they kept going downhill. The air rats now come to sea level. They can do a little better at sea level, but you now take them back to the atmosphere, low oxygen atmosphere of Albuquerque, and what happened? They did worse. The hyperbaric oxygen rats did great. This is the first and only demonstration of improvement of chronic brain injury in animals in the history of science. And the joke of it was, we've been doing this in humans for many years until the dumb doctor comment about, well, it's more believable if you had an animal model. So there it is. But what it did was it reinforced the clinical effects of hyperbaric oxygen in chronic brain injury, the brain blood flow changes we had seen, and even in a pediatric case, which I won't go into. So the last question I want to ask is, how about veterans? You know, if this works in all these patients we've done this with, it works in animal model, why wouldn't it work in all these veterans with blast-induced traumatic brain injury? Well, there's no reason why not. It's all the same, really. Uh, some nuances are different. So we went to Walter Reed and we offered, listen, I'll treat these people for, you know, some veterans for free. Send them down to us. You test them before and after. They wouldn't do it. So we went to Congress. We did a number of things. We finally got money for a study. And before that, I brought a number of patients down, and I had made a statement in, that ended up in USA Today that I would treat veterans at our expense. And what ended up happening was a Boston judge's son had come home from Iraq, and 25-year-old, he had had seven IEDs, rocket-propelled grenades, loss of consciousness with two of them, and by the end of it, this was his quote, I was starting to think with my machine gun. Now, that's not good if you're an Iraqi, but it, it's probably not good also for your, the guys that you're fighting with um, in terms of accidents and so on. But he had a host of cognitive symptoms. He ended up honorably, medically, uh, honorably discharged, 10% for PTSD, 10% for his post-concussion syndrome. And we brought him down, we treated him. Headaches were gone after this first treatment. I was kind of shocked, but we'd seen this before. By the eighth, the nightmares he was having nightly, throwing him out of bed, he was now sleeping through the night. And then he went down to the French Quarter to kind of see how he'd do tolerating crowds. Well, it was the French Quarter Festival weekend, 400,000 people on the streets. He passed. But this is what blew us away. He came in and he said his PTSD was gone. And finally we re-imaged him and took a look at what had happened. Well, these are the transverse images, and I'm just going to comb down on them because what I want you to look at is that pattern. Do you see how kind of heterogeneous this is with all the bright yellows and the purple and so on? And here is this kind of smooth pastel look. This is what normal looks like on the left. And on the right was before we had done the hyperbarics with him, you have this variation, highs and lows, high, low, high, low. Well, a human brain at rest, brain, brain blood flow is in a narrow range. So on a color map, there's very little variation. And this was after his treatment, less variation. Well, there's a way to look at it with three-dimensional imaging. And of course, you have to ask the question, what's a normal? Well, I've now scanned 85 normal people. And the computer can do a three-dimensional reconstruction of the outermost part of that brain scan. So you're looking right at a person, forehead is here, so these are the temporal lobes. Eye sockets sit here, and there's the right temporal, left temporal, I'm sorry, frontal lobes up here. And the two cerebellar lobes in the back, and this is the brain stem coming up. So you're looking at face on. Now remember what I showed you with that slide. Where's primary injury in traumatic brain injury? Orbital frontal and anterior temporal lobes. Okay. Well, this is Time Magazine's, the face of our U.S. soldier. And here's the brain behind the face of the Marlboro soldier. So here he was, pre-hyperbaric oxygen. And again, look at where this is. Inferior frontal lobes, orbital frontal, and both temporal lobes. And here he was after a month of treatment. Now, we didn't cure him, okay? He looked much better. As it turns out, he's gone along 
to get additional treatment. He has a job, he's finishing college, he's doing very well. The point was, we were able to reestablish blood flow there and with it function. So what happened was we got a congressional appropriation to go ahead and do a study on the veterans, and I'm going to kind of race through it. And the thing I want to point out for you is right here. Turn, this was the, for the first 15, but all 30, the average was three years post last blast. And you had to have a minimum one blast with loss of consciousness. Turns out many of them had two to three. One guy had 20. And these were just the symptom improvements, if you look at it. You see all the high numbers, but improvement in majority, of, or not the symptom, but improvement in majority of their symptom list uh, in the secondary symptom list, questions I asked them, uh, physical exam abnormalities, a good chunk of them were able to discontinue or decrease their psychiatric or psychoactive medication. And then a six-month follow-up, the ones who said they were improved had stayed improved. Wouldn't have the money to bring them back and test them. If we look at symptoms, headaches, sleep, memory, cognition, and so on, fairly high percentage of them, you know, not perfect, were saying that they were improved. And here's some of the additional symptoms. You can see that those with decreased hearing, ringing in the ear, and arthralgias, aching in the muscles, we didn't impact at all. In fact, they had very, very little effect. And there's some reason, but interestingly, these are the things in decompression sickness that we also can't impact in delayed fashion. And there's some thought now that part of what's happening with BLAST is subclinical lung injury, where air is then getting into the bloodstream and causing a decompression sickness type of syndrome, which is what is a little different about blast injuries with veterans. Well, here's the cognitive testing, and forget all the numbers. It, uh, if we just look at the outcome, full-scale IQ, memory, <coughs> another memory, memory, attention, concentration, executive function, and other attention, they were significant on many of these tests. Not all of them, not perfect, but fairly significant. And then when we looked at post-concussion symptom questionnaire, PTSD's checklist the military has, measures of depression, anxiety, quality of life, and then their estimate of how they did, all of them also improved. Well, remember those pictures I showed you earlier. Where is the injury? Primarily in the white matter. Well, we did brain imaging on them, and what we found by a very sophisticated analysis these are all the areas showing improvement in blood flow after hyperbaric treatment. And you look at them, many of them are in the white matter or at the gray-white interface. You can get this article, it's free online. The computer also has a way of reconstructing it and what we did was, you know, in, in statistics, a p-value uh, is a statistical measure, it, it, kind of derivative, I'll say it in a little bit different way, of whether your findings are significant or not as a change from a baseline or compared to another group. And usually the value is 0.05, which means there's a 5% chance that maybe uh, it wasn't real, that uh, it was just a chance occurrence that you saw improvement. So we took a one in a thousand chance that what we saw in the imaging was maybe a fluke and tried to see if there were changes and there were 85 significant areas of improvement. You can see after one treatment, the areas in red that improved, but after 40, what was improving were wide areas of, of blood flow in the brain. And here are the rest of the views. Again, after one treatment, after 40. Well, remember the RAT study, right? The hippocampus controls short-term memory. So what we did was have the computer strip out the hippocampus and look at significant increases in blood flow, if they were there, that would match the improvements in memory. Here it is after one treatment, you can see it on the right, left hippocampus, not much, there's a little bit in the left, and here's the sagittal view. But look what happened after the 40 treatments where we measured the improvements on memory function. What we showed was a significant improvement in blood flow to the hippocampus. So we had improvement in blood flow, improvement in tested function, and the patient saying their memory was better. And here are just the other views, before and after one, or just after one treatment and after 40. So essentially, after a month of this, and we compressed it, I don't usually like to do it this fast, but we were under some urgency to do it. We had an improvement in symptoms, 15-point increase in full-scale IQ, which is a little exaggerated, partly because of their PTSD, increase in cognition, 30% decrease in PTSD. This is the most in any one-month period of time of anything that's so far been published. 
uh, 8 of 14 no longer met the criteria for PTSD, and then significant improvements in uh, depression, anxiety, and their percent back to normal rating scale. Well, we've now treated over 50. One was, uh, was another veteran who came from NATO. Uh, and we've analyzed the additional 14 subjects and all of the data is the same. And we didn't have a control group in here uh, for a number of reasons. So one was the, uh, we thought it'd be difficult to recruit, but we didn't have the money to do it. And it was supposed to be a pilot study just to get solid data. Uh, well, as it turns out, this has now been duplicated in a number of other places, and it also duplicated our animal study. But it also reinforced what Dr. Neubauer had shown with that stroke study in terms of being able to reclaim function after many, many years' time. Uh, it's reinforced what we had seen originally with some boxers, and then over the last so many years, 22 years or so at that time, well, again, we didn't do a control group, but what happened was we did a sensitivity analysis on those first 15. And I if all of this was placebo effect, it would have to account for 50 to 75% of the measured effect. The problem is the changes that we saw in the imaging, nobody has ever documented with placebo effect. Well, there's some statistical arguments against that also, and I'm gonna get to in just a second, but essentially if we come to a little conclusion here, Mild to moderate TBI, at least, is primarily a white matter injury. And it leaves white matter wounds in the brain. Well, hyperbaric oxygen has been traditionally a treatment for wounds. We've had an animal study that has shown this in chronic traumatic brain injury. And we've now shown this in these veterans. Um, well, what ended up happening, there were letters written to the editor on the article. and. Uh, what we ended up answering it with were some comments. And essentially, this data, now as it is, meets the criteria for evidence-based medicine for the combined diagnoses of PTSD and post-concussion syndrome, since there is no treatment out there. And this was published information on that. But what else happened was the statistician, you'd have to read the articles and some objections that were made, but our statistician answered one of them. They were trying to claim that there was a statistical fluctuation where one of our measures could have been just by chance. And so he turned around and he said, well, we had 15 of 21 outcome variables that were statistically significant. To have a chance occurrence for that to occur in a study would be less than one in a quadrillion. So. The rest of it would have to be due to placebo if it happened, and that wasn't the case. So I'm gonna end with one last comment here. Uh, how about acute traumatic brain injury? Well, we didn't even address this. The reason is the studies have been done. There are four randomized controlled styles, uh, uh, trials, excuse me, beginning in Germany, France, the United States. There's one in China now. And then there were two additional ones that were done that were metabolic studies in the United States, all of them done by neurosurgeons. And what they are collectively showing is that there's roughly a 60%, look at this, 55, 59, 63% reduction in mortality in acute severe traumatic brain injury with just a few treatments. And the latest they rendered them was three to 10 days after treatment. Now you know the time for cerebral edema is generally in the three to four day period post TBI. I mean it can happen earlier but it peaks about that time. <coughs> and what they're able to show is that even with a few treatments there was a remarkable effect on brain blood flow, edema, oxygenation, and essentially reduction in death rate. Well, I don't know, I, I've looked and looked and uh, I'm gonna give you the comment down below here but you know, if we look at these acute TBI studies, they had consistent data across all of them. There were multiple different doses of hyperbarics used, so it, it wasn't dose dependent so much, but there was one common dose in a number of them that worked very well. They were randomized, prospective, and controlled, which is considered level one evidence, all performed by neurosurgeons, not hyperbaric doctors, so they can't accuse us of trying to make money off of it and altering the data. It was underpinned by a lot of animal data that they quote in there, and the reduction in mortality is equivalent to what was done with penicillin, the helicopter in Vietnam for battlefield casualties, and maybe the ambulance in the United States. So this ranks up there with probably some of the most effective treatments that have come out there, but unfortunately, it hasn't been accepted for a variety of reasons. 
the challenge is 100 years of what I like to consider dogma. I mean, everybody's been told, I was told this in medical school, there's nothing you can do for brain injury. Well, we have a whole specialty, physiatry, that's devoted to trying to maximize outcomes, not neurology. And even in neurosurgery, it hasn't done that. Operatively, yes. It reaffirmed a therapy that has been discredited. I talk about this in my book. I was told on my very first rotation in medical school, we walked by a group of doctors standing outside uh, a ward and discussing a patient. And I heard one of them say, hey, how about hyperbaric oxygen? And I waited till I was down the hall and I asked the, the resident, I said, what is hyperbaric oxygen? He says, oh, it is non-science. It's been thoroughly disproven. It's a fraud, snake oil sales, and charlatanism. I said, okay. So that was 1978, and that was right there until I came to New Orleans and found myself in this diving group, going to the courses and learning about what we were doing in these divers, which really made no sense, and getting to the bottom of the science of it, and then we had some of these serendipitous discoveries, but the whole point was, this is pretty much what we've been taught, irrespective of what the science is showing. And it's, it's been based on, uh, based on also some misperception and, and misunderstanding. So I want to end with a thank you. These are all the people that, that uh, worked with uh, on this study who helped uh, immeasurably. Um, my wife and Claire, who uh, did all the phone work and other <laughs> background work, and uh, my various partners, and um, some people in Washington, D.C. The, the one who wrote the introduction of our book that I told you about, who's a lobbyist, but uh, used to work in one of the congressional offices, it's the ex Secretary of the Army during uh, Vietnam, the later years ex-director of the uh, uh, Selective Service, and a few other people there. And then these were all the people that donated money because we went out and we essentially begged for donations to do it. Uh, we'd been promised funding by the military and it, it didn't happen. So even West Wego Swamp Boat Tours, they donated uh, <laughs> some, uh, some tickets for the veterans to use when they came down. And finally, I just want to say one last thing, and that is, you know, this is all data, statistics, and so on, but these belong to real people, you know, casualties of war whose lives were really destroyed by the traumatic brain injury, post-concussion syndrome, and PTSD, and what is not shown here is the impact that uh, this has had on restoring them and their families. In fact, we just got a phone call from subject number three in our study who's now graduated from college, and he just got a job with honors, with honors excuse oh. me, uh, who was just so dysfunctional, and uh, he got a job with a major traumatic brain injury foundation. So, another success story. And uh, I think that's it. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, I didn't keep track of the time. Oop, I think we're overdue. You know about doing a study on football players? Mm -hmm. We're trying. We are trying. I've treated a few. Uh, uh, one of them who was in the Batman <coughs> Advocate had an article on his improvement. Uh, you know, that, that's a tricky situation because, um, I mean, we've had some talks and the doctors that are in charge of this for the NFL uh, we have interfaced with, and um, you know, they recently made that hundred million dollar gift to the National Institutes of Health. But uh, I don't know if this is going to happen with the hyperbaric oxygen. Uh, it's just a very kind of politically sensitive thing, and what they don't realize is that this actually could prolong the game. Because uh, if what I didn't talk about here are the patients that we've treated with acute post concussion syndrome two of my sons, my nephew, a variety of others, but it's not two months of treatment. It's two, three, five, seven treatments, and their symptoms are ameliorated. So, uh, I mean, you have the potential to preserve function, maybe even let them play longer. I don't know. That's another decision, but it's not so threatening. Yeah? So the increased blood flow seems to be, even after just a few treatments, fairly well, I wouldn't say that. I mean, what we're measuring, that's three hours after that one treatment. And while there can be some persistent effect to it, uh, not usually, not as, as measurable. There's uh, there are a number of different things that are happening here. Um, and as with repetitive treatment, we're affecting these more trophic changes that are more per permanent. So, yeah, you don't get the, except if it's acute. I take it back. 
in, in the acute setting, if you look at a couple of those studies, they only did two to three treatments in Germany. Yeah. Uh, really, the uh, no, there aren't many. I mean, I, when I think back over the years with all the wound indications, we have put just about everybody in a chamber with even the relative contraindications, and you can make accommodations <coughs> for them. So, I mean, you have to be careful with dosing if you have somebody with a seizure disorder, active asthma, uh, that type of thing. But for the most part, for the patients that are being treated with chronic brain injury, in this lower pressure range, there aren't a lot of contraindications. Yeah. Uh, long time fan, Dr. Harsh. Uh, yesterday I presented, and I threw some numbers out that I learned in Washington, D.C., two weeks ago, a traumatic brain injury awareness day. And yeah. the CDC released a 3.5 million number, and I'll break it down in an email. Ah, from my wife. Okay. You're right. Yeah, it's very unusual. They, they ended up going back to Well, I mean, Dr. Katz can talk about that. I mean, it's, it's the numbers out there. He Take two more, and then we're going to move on. Okay. Yeah. Is any treatment for hemolysis, hemolysia, with a brain um, stroke? It depends on the cause. I've actually got a patient right now we're treating. You know, if you affect the cortex, the visual cortex, and you knock it out, and it's been a long time, uh, what happens is that variable margin of tissue that at first is not dead, more or less stunned. What happens with time is that much of that's converted to dead tissue. So it, it, if it's in the cortex, by the time you get out there, you can have a very sharp <coughs> drop off from normal tissue to dead tissue. And no, you won't get much function back. If it's in the white matter, it's a different story. If it's a brain bleed in the white matter, similarly, it's a little bit different. But if you actually are taking out a blood vessel, like a thrombotic stroke, <coughs> and you're losing <laughs> that area, and it's, <coughs> it's been a while, that's why we look at it with the imaging, because you can get an idea. But yeah, that's, it depends on the actual injury and the anatomy of it. Yeah. Uh, I want to know the cost. OK. It is generally, at physicians with their doctors, about $200 a treatment or $200 an hour. In the hospital, right down the street from us, so that's what it is at our facility at, at West Jefferson Medical Center, it's $1,850 an hour. But that's if you can get them to treat. Most of the hospitals won't do that, but now <laughs> there are the hospitals, there are more and more people who have experienced this, and the hospitals are beginning to treat patients at a reasonable rate. Medicare rate, for instance, is about $350 an hour. So. Okay, and uh, like if it's a thirty-year, the a thirty-year injury, is it less? Depending uh, on the injury, it can help. Okay. But it, you know, I don't <laughs> tell people to expect dramatic changes That's with what it. I wanted to know cost you know. versus improvement. Well, yeah. yeah, cost effectiveness. I mean, yeah, it's exactly. a, it becomes a more difficult thing to predict the farther out you are. And even, well, even with acute and subacute, you know, it's somewhat proportional how much brain tissue has been lost. If you've lost a lot of brain tissue and are severely, you know, injured, you are not going to get the same effect functionally in terms of ability to return to work, et cetera, that someone with a mild traumatic brain injury is going to have. But it can help you because it is still treating the underlying disease processes. That's the key. And yeah, I, you're the last, I guess. After 90 dies, would it be beneficial to continue the treatment, or once you get to around 90, it, it becomes ineffective? Uh, the, the answer is yes, it can be beneficial. But see, everybody is different. The way this started, this was all clinically generated. This wasn't me prescriptively <coughs> saying, you need 35, you need 160, you need 6,000. There was none of that. We started in a very desperate situation with a few of these divers, where nobody had done it on them. And it was, how many treatments do you need? And I called my mentor from a little hospital up there in Slidell. He was down in Florida. I said, look, we, we've got this diver. He's now formally demented. What, what do you think? Number one, I've never treated a diver, he told me. I said, wow, it's crazy. You're in South Florida. You've never treated a diver. <laughs> and he said, no, but maybe you can try what I've done with stroke and multiple, sc multiple sclerosis. I said, OK, how many treatments? He said, he needs 200. Well, in that day, that's a quarter million dollars of medical care because it was being done at a hospital. They were charging $1,250 a treatment. 
and I just said it's totally crazy, nobody's done it, we're not gonna get it. What is the minimum number to see a permanent measurable improvement? And he said, oh, why don't you try 40? And I said, why 40? He said, well, over the years it was a good number. Well, <laughs> that sounds flippant, but what happened was if you went down to South Florida, you got as much treatment as you had time and resources for. You had a trust fund in two years, you got 300 treatments. You had a week, you had a week. But what he found was people who got to about 40 retained benefit and called back and said, hey, I want to come back. They came back, they looked better. As it turns out, if you look in all of hyperbaric medicine, chronic wounding, what are the protocols? They're all about 40 treatments, diabetic foot, radiation injury, et cetera. And so what happened was we started investigating this in 40 treatment block. We stopped at 40, re-image, re-examine, re-video, re-everything. And what happened? Patients went back, saw their caregivers, and called up and said, look, can we do more? more, don't know how many more. Okay, we'll try another group of 40. We got to the same point, we got to 80. 80 is where all of those presentations to the meetings came from. And, and what happened, many of the patients didn't want to go get imaged again. We don't need that. Oh, I don't need anybody to tell me I am better. Okay, fine. Well, can I have some more? More, we don't know. By the time we did a third block of that in a six month period, it was too much. We toxified them. They improved and then they went back. And so what happens is, it is a, it, it, from day one, and it's the same today, it is a clinical dosing. You treat to clinical plateau, and what we found is that over time, I've got one of the divers in the textbook who was a meteorologist up in Slidell, I've been treating for 22 years. He comes in, he gets one treatment a month. He worked another 15 years, retired, you wouldn't know him, he's 72 now. He's at the top of his game. He had, he had very, uh, he had a very good uh, dose of decompression sickness. And what's happened is he continues to get a little benefit from this. So he's got a permanent effect and we even went back and imaged him to see what was going on. And uh, so the point is, you dose it clinically. Forget the numbers, all those stuff on the internet. Who's an expert on the internet? Anybody with a keyboard, right? <laughs> you read all sorts of stuff. So. Thank you, anyway. Dr. Horst. Thank you. Thanks. 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 positive information, but if you want to speak to Dr. Hoss, I'm sure stick, stick around a couple minutes. But well, we got to move on because we'll be only between now and half hours lunch.